if you start doing it for the wrong reasons, you start saying that, hey, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm, I'm better than someone or I want to make more money than someone, it's not going to work out. I feel like the day that the pro- that profit goes over passion is kind of like the day that, like, like I mean, profit's always good. Like, you know, you want to make sure it's that you're secured and all yeah. that. But yeah. like also, like you want to make sure the passion's over there. The yeah. day that you lose the passion is coming. Yeah, the passion and the other P is the people, man. You yeah. know, the people. Yeah, take no, care. Don't forget people. about people because without people, you can't do no, anything. No, that's, that's true. Too. You know what I'm saying? There's, there's like, there's no me without people. Yeah. There's no me without you. Mm-hmm. Without yeah. people to be on this platform, there's no platform. Without people for you to dispatch and. And, and 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 help them build their company mm-hmm. there's no you consulting absolutely you know right. what i'm saying so it's it all you know works together man turn my mic up for you take there yeah yeah uh on the road to the riches life takes a toll like bridges good friends become foes and snitches better watch who knows in your business 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 all right, all right, all right, Hustle Fam, Hustle Fam. We are back with another amazing episode. And today we have back a friend to the show, my brother, Sam Chaudhry. What's up, my brother? Are you consulting? It's good to be back, man. Yeah, man. It's, it's been, how long has it been since since your last episode? I was, I was on with you in uh, December of 2020. Okay, December of 2020. And now we're into 2022. And I hear there's been some big changes, man, some some big growth in your business. Uh, you know, you reached out to me and you said you you want to come on and you want to bring some more heat, man. So when somebody wants to bring the heat, I ha- I have no choice but to let them come on this on the platform and, and bring it, man. The people that people want to hear. No, I got a lot of heat. <laughs> but first off, I, I want to appreciate you and your platform, Truck and Hustle. It helps uh, bring exposure out to entrepreneurs like me. Yeah. And uh, even your podcast from last time, I'm very indebted to you. You know what I mean? I appreciate you. Everybody in the truck trucking community that I know that follows you or me, they really love you and really respect you within the community. So we are very, very appreciative of you and this platform that you have for everybody. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Getting some early flowers before we even get started. All right, Absolutely. cool. I'll take them. I'll take them. All right, man. So listen, uh, you Consulting is a dispatch company. Yes. Right. Uh, also, consulting, dispatching. You help people grow their businesses. You help investors start trucking companies, and you've had some, you know, really great success, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. So we're going to talk about that. It seems like everybody and their mother wants to start a dispatch company these days. So it's a very po- popular topic. I don't think you know people could stop hearing enough about it. But I, I think that we could always, you know, continue to learn more, right, from other people, other uh, business people who are doing it. Because the the ultimate goal of this show is to give as much free knowledge and free value that we possibly can. So um, that's what we're here to do, man. So quickly, before we kind of get into that, just kind of, you know, brief people on your story a little bit. For people who may have not heard the first podcast and and don't really know who you are, just just, just let's kind of run through that real fast. You know, who who, who is Sam Chaudhry? Uh, So me, you know, uh, I had a pretty rough upbringing. You know what I mean? I was, uh, I went to prison at the age of 15. You know what I mean? I did five years and uh, just running in and out of the streets. You know what I mean? Because for me growing up, you know, even being adopted and stuff, I just didn't think that there was any other opportunity for me and me not being excelling in school because, you know, I'm dyslexic. I can't really understand. And then being expelled and being, you know, just being in trouble all the time. I thought my only option was the streets. So, you know, in and out of jail, you know what I mean? Back and forth. And right now I'm 29 years old, but I could probably say that from that point, to now I've turned my life around tenfold over. But the way it uh, it happened was just constantly getting knocked down. You know what I mean? Life just keep throwing you down and then you eventually find a way out. You know what I mean? And trucking is something that I've been doing since I was 10. My uncles are really big in this business. They've been in this business since for like 30 years now. And I learned a lot from them. So, you know, always, anytime I got, like wanted to get on the right road, I always had a dispatching job because I was very good at managing trucks, managing routes, driver communication, and how to make sure that the numbers are looking good. So, you know, I worked uh, after my last time, you know, doing a little stint. uh, I went and uh, started working at a diner. This was in 2018. So I was working. How old were you at this time? I think uh, maybe about 26. Okay. 
26 years old. Got you. Got you. So you said, just to, just to recap that, you said you went to, to prison at 15? Yeah. This was like a juvenile prison? It was a juvenile. I was Jamesburg, New Jersey. Jamesburg, New Jersey. Yeah. How long were you there? About five years. I got out. Five years. You got out at 20 years old. And then you said you did another... Yeah, I, I, I was in and out. Still kind of in the streets. Yeah, still. And did another what? Another five years? Uh, I did a year. Okay. I, I represented myself pro se. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I represent... It was, I was in... Uh, you one of those guys. Huh? I was in Essex County. <laughs> I was in Essex County. I was representing myself pro se. Okay. And... Uh, All right, Hustle Fam. Listen, y'all. I am here live on location at OTR Capital. Happy to announce our new strategic partnership with OTR Capital. I'm here with Grace Marr. My friend, how are you, Grace? Awesome, it's so good to have you here. When, when we aligned with somebody, aligned with a brand, we wanted to make sure that we had the right people standing behind us and, and that could help our community and kind of take them further along in their journey because you know we can only bring them so far, right? We need to create those strategic partnerships to take them to the next level. And that's what I think that this relationship and this partnership is gonna do. Grace, tell the people a little bit about OTR and what you guys do. Yeah, thanks, Ramel. So we are a factoring company you know, we've been doing this for 10 years. We're dedicated to trucking companies' success and offering tools and services to help them to continue to succeed. Education is so important to us for our clients and helping them continue to grow their business. I know we have similar missions, you know, um, we really do care about trucking companies and we're both from a trucking background. You know, OTR isn't a financial services company coming off of a bank where, you know, we're based out of transportation and third party logistics company and you yourself, you know, ran trucking and had a CDL. So yep. it's like, you know, for us, it's just, it's amazing to be able to come together in this way. The, the, the culture here is awesome. Um, I love working with you guys. I love the people here. And it's great, man. I think we could do some, some beautiful things together, create epic content, add epic value. And I'm really excited and looking forward to doing this with you guys. I mean, it took me a long time to really, you know, partner with someone in this way. And I decided to do it with you guys because I feel that you're the right company to add value to, to our audience. We completely agree. We're super excited, thrilled to be a part of it. Thank you so much. Truck and Hustle OTR, we're now together. We're locked in. Hustle fam, you know we love y'all. If you smell something burning, it's only your desire. <laughs> I was in Essex County. I was representing myself pro se. Okay. And uh, I beat the case. Uh, you know, I, I beat the case and um, I got out. Okay. And then at that point, I, I kind of realized that so I was when I was in there my first month, I was like, I don't have money for an attorney. I don't have nothing. You know what I mean? No family support. And then I went to a Juma one time and a brother from Ivory Coast was there. And he was like, if you don't got nobody, you got God. God's your lawyer. You know what mm. I mean? You need to fight this. So then I started fighting and I started learning like in law libraries, looking for loopholes in my case. I started writing my own briefs and the federal judge I was in front of, uh, Finstein was his name, Judge Finstein. Okay. He was so impressed and then he just, you know what I mean? He, he granted me my release. Okay. And after a year. So once I got out, I realized that this is my chance. Okay. At that time, you know, I was facing losing everything. So I, I realized this is my chance. I got to hustle. I got to work hard. I got to make something happen here. And this was about three years ago. Okay, got you. So this is the, the you, you, you basically beat that case, you got out of that situation, and now you, um, you said you're 26 years old, right? Now I'm 29, at the time well, I was 26. At that time you were 26, right? Yeah. And you said, what, what were you doing at that time? You said you started? Oh, when I got out? Yeah. So I got out, and that same week, I uh, started working at a diner. Okay, I so, had no cooking diner. so yeah. we're getting to the diner. All right, talk about it. So yeah, so I started working at the diner. I'm doing 14 hours a day. At the diner, it was a diner in Maplewood, New Jersey, and uh, I hated it. <laughs> I hated it so bad. Uh, I used to be like sore because it's all like Spanish people working back there, and they hardworking people. <laughs> so for me, Pakistani, <laughs> being in the streets and being entitled and all this other stuff, it was a tough job for me. But I knew I needed the money, and I knew I didn't have another chance. Right. If I go back doing what I was doing before, I would be messed up. You know what I mean? And I made a vow to myself: if that judge releases me, I'm gonna do the right thing. And that's exactly what I did. So then four or five months go, I keep on my, I have one day off. On that one day off, I keep applying at trucking companies. I eventually got my big break at Chariot Express. Okay. That's, a, that's a company which uh, I was working at a dispatch, as a dispatcher for, and I was managing 14 of their trucks by myself. Mm -hmm. And one of the owners, he was so impressed by me that he wanted to start a company with me. 
You know what I mean? He wanted to set, start a separate company with me. And I took advantage of the opportunity. The company we named it Shark Logistics, and it failed. It failed horribly. You know what I mean? The driver that we had, he was high on cocaine, and he killed somebody in North Carolina. And uh, we got hit with 11 lawsuits. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So 2020, everything was looking bleak. With the coronavirus, we were failing everything, and we didn't know what to do next. So my partner, he had a bunch of pharmacies that he could lean back on. I didn't. So I had to find out what's next. What do I do next? And I started applying at companies, trying to get a job, this, that, third. You know, but one guy, he had 100 trucks, and he gave me like a little bit of like an ego. I guess, I don't know. He asked around about me and heard about my background, and he was like, no, I'm not hiring you. Mm. So at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm not going back to that route. I'm not trying to be an employee. I'm trying to be a business owner and I got to do whatever it takes to make it happen. So then I start thinking about the dispatching side. So I start reaching out to established carriers and I'm like, Hey, do you guys need a dispatcher? And, um, just keep getting rejected. Everybody's comfortable with that. So then I went back to the drawing board and I came up with a new strategy. I want to start getting investors who have no background in this business, in the business. And at first I did it for free. You know what I mean? You own the business. You own the truck. I will charge you a percentage later once we start getting rolling. Right. And that's how I figured out a strategy to get more carriers. I started getting police officers, teachers, people who had no background in this business, in this business, and actually make them successful. Got you. Got you. All right. Cool. So that kind of kind of brings us to, you know, what you do today, right? Yeah. So let, let, let's start from, let's start here. So what what is dispatching to you when you think of being a dispatcher when you think of your function as a dispatcher for these these investors and these people that you work with what 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 does that mean to you for me it, it means that like i've been through something traumatizing with the whole you know the driver killing somebody dealing with lawsuits having the company shut down and for me i've i've seen the worst you know what i mean so i know what the pitfalls of this business are so I don't want someone else to have to go through that same exact thing. And dispatching is just more than just routing these guys. You have to be able to communicate with the driver, make sure they're comfortable because you're trusting the drivers with these equipments. You know what I mean? The drivers come first. Right. You know what I mean? They're the backbones of this business because they're the ones out there putting themselves on the risk to make sure that the brokers, the customers, carriers, everybody is satisfied. So we make sure that we did comfortable routing for them. And at the same time, we're keeping the numbers up for the investors. Because if now someone goes and buys these trucks, they invest thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 based off of what I told them and they don't have no experience, it's my job to make sure that I make them successful. And so far, we've had a 0% failure rate. None of my guys that I've started in this business since I started this have failed. Mm. So everybody has been successful. Some guys went from one to 10 trucks. Some guys went from one to eight trucks. You know what I mean? Like one-stop trucking went from one to uh, eight trucks right now. And we're just growing, you know what I mean? Everybody's growing. Got you. So what what type of people are do you look to work with? What type of investors do you look to work with? Do you only work with just investors solely? Is that like your business model? People who pretty much don't know anything about the trucking industry and you kind of take them, hold their hand through it? Is is that what you do solely? Well, no. Okay. That, that was the start. Okay. That was for me to establish myself and let my work speak for itself. So, you know because I was going to establish people and they didn't take me seriously, I had to go this route. Now we have referrals coming in all the time, like of people that already are established, but they're looking to make more money and they heard good things about us. So we start taking them on as well, but we're still doing that side as well. Okay. And the type of people that I like to work with are people that are coachable. This business is very unregulated. There's a lot of shadows. There's a lot of things that people will not see and they'll get hit by. So in my opinion, we need, one leader, one person that's able to make everything come together. And I believe I'm the person to do that. So I need somebody that's coachable. You know what I mean? That's someone that's willing to learn, some, someone that's willing to uh, work with others. And if you can't do that, like if I, I've, I've had people come at me and say, I'll give you this much amount of money. I got this much amount of money. I got this. I'm like, it's not going to work out. <laughs> it's not going to work out. Got you. Got I need you. people that are driven. 
Yeah. So, so with the investors, you take them through the process of actually purchasing the truck. What, what, what's the process for them when you when you work with somebody? If I'm an investor. I come to you. Are you going to ask me, hey, okay, well, how much you know liquid do you have? Like, what type of questions do you have up front? And then, what are the steps to take me from not from not having a trucking company to having my own company and working with you? So, there's two sides. One is, let's say you're a driver. You're a driver. You're trying to better your situation. You know what I mean? Those they already, they already know what's going on with the truck and everything in this business. So with them, it's a little bit easier. I tell them exactly, find out what state they are. I do some research, find out where the compliance offices are to get them to open up their MC, DOT, LLC, and then uh, help them get their insurance, get in contact with the insurance people, get them the truck. You know what I mean? So we basically help with the whole nine on, on the driver's side. And then the investor side is a little bit more complicated because Again, these are people that don't know much about the business. Right. So I have like this welcome packet, which I wrote down myself, and I break down everything about the business that they can comprehend right away. I go over it with them, and then after that, we go step by step. Step one, let's open up the company. Step two, let's go get the truck. Step three, let's get the insurance. Once it's active, we have a three-week period to uh, find a driver. Then we start putting up ads. We start looking for driver agencies, find the right driver. We interview them. I interview them personally on behalf of the owners as their operation manager and make sure that we find the right person on the team that can do the type of work that we're trying to get them to, done, to do. We have a, a wide range of lanes now because we've grown a lot since the December of 2020. At that time, you Consulting was making maybe $1,000 a month. It was, we were still starting out. Right now, we're making 101000 a month. Mm, gotcha. and, and I showed you the numbers. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No cat, no cat. How, 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 do, how do you set the expectation for these investors? Because, you know, I think right now people see the trucking, you know, industry as sexy. And they think that they could come in, jump in and make a, a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. Right? What, what are you telling these people? Are you telling them that, hey... I can make you a bunch of money. Are you saying, hey, listen, it may not go like that. What, what's the expectation that you're setting when you're working with somebody? Well, I kind of vet them out. You know what I mean? If someone shows me interest and they're coming out and they're actually trying to seek the information and they're actually very cooperative and, and they want to learn, they want to ask questions, those are the people that are actually going to be successful, in my opinion. But the people that come in and start demanding stuff and just think that they can just throw money around in this business, I don't work with them. And I've tried it. And they usually end up failing. Mm. You know what I mean? I've tried it with one guy. I took him to his, he was successful while he was with me. Then he went out and he was like, you know what? I'm going to try to get cheaper margins, this, that, third. I'm going to try to go over here to a different person because, you know, me and you butt heads sometimes. The reason we butt heads is because I'm the one that got him into this business and I'm trying to teach him that there's a certain way to do things. And he just was like, no, I feel as I can just throw my money around wherever I want. And those type of people, I really don't like working with. And I don't work with. I, that's why it's exclusive. And I take on a very small amount of people per month because it's a tedious process. And right. it's a process which takes, uh, you know, time and a lot of effort. Got you. When you say they're throwing their money around, what are they throwing their money at? What, well, what, what do they think money is going to fix? Well, money could fix the systems. Money can fix the, uh, the get them basically whatever they want. But that's not the... That's not how it works. You know what I'm saying? So like, let's say they'll try to go get these systems like pro transport or this or that, you know, and try to establish these systems before they actually establish the cash flow. You know what I'm saying? Because they have that. A lot of the people like I work with like police officers, like teachers, these are people with like regular jobs who are still uh, looking and their backs are up against the wall. They mm -hmm. want to try to get more income and stuff like that. So they're willing to actually put in the effort because you need research. You know what I mean? Like a, if a person with money could go to a mechanic and let's say something, and this has happened to one of my guys, they can go and let's say the mechanic just gives them a price. For instance, uh, there was a starter that was wrong in one of my guys' uh, one of my client's truck. And they call the mechanic and ask him how much it's going to be. And he said $2,500. So I said, okay. I call up the uh, mechanic in front of him and I said, uh, how much do you think the parts are? He says, oh, I'll get the bill later. I'll to BSing me. You know what I mean? He's like, just $2,500 is the price. I said, okay. Then I called the dealer. It was a Freightliner dealership. I called the dealer. I give him the VIN number. And I'm like, hey, how much is this starter? He said, $250. So then I called the mechanic back. I'm like, you know uh, when the truck is going to be ready? We'll give you the $2,500. And he said, oh, it'll probably take me like four or five hours. So I said, okay, so the dealer is telling us that the part is $250. And 
you're telling us it's going to take us four or five hours to fix. Right. So where where you get 2500 from, bro? Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So these are the type of things in this business that a lot of people need to actually do their research. You know what I mean? If you're the owner for maintenance, this, that, the third, you got to save money. You can't just throw money around because that's mm. you're going to take losses. Now, if I didn't catch on to that, maybe 250 for a starter, 250 for labor, that's $500. You you just went negative 2000 because you thought you could just throw money around before doing the research. Got you. It's like the guy who comes on the basketball court with like the knee pads and the goggles and all this equipment, but they don't know how to the form of a jump shot. Yeah. It's like you go, you're speeding too fast. You're trying to have all the equipment and and you're trying to you know dress everything up, but you're not doing the fundamentals right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And there's a second part to that. You may be good at other businesses. Mm -hmm. You may know how to make a business, but this business right here, excuse my language, is a B word. You know, it's it's. It's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough business to be in because there's so many moving parts. Right. You know what I mean? If you lose your driver, you you might lose your insurance coverage. You might get an audit from DOT. You know what I mean? The truck might get into an accident. You might get an insurance claim. You the truck driver might hit somebody. There's so many, the truck might break down. There's so many ways that things can go wrong. So it's a risky business. You know what I mean? It's high risk, high reward. But at the same time, you gotta find the risk and try to minimize them as much as possible versus throwing your money at them because then you're just going to lose. It's not a money game. It's a drive game and it's an understanding game. Got you. Got you. All right. So when you, you also said that you try to get your, your guys comfortable routing, what, what does comfortable routing mean? Comfortable routing is that we try to look for lanes. Like for instance, we have a bunch of different lanes that we work with. We got mail routes, we got unify routes. So some going to the city because I, I have a majority of my guys out here in the tri-state. Then I have some in Atlanta and stuff like that. So I want to understand what makes this driver comfortable while he's working. Okay. I don't want the driver to come in every day and feel like that he's being overworked or he's being, you know, he's not comfortable doing certain things. I wouldn't send a driver to New York City or Bronx or Brooklyn with those trucks if he's not comfortable doing it because what if he gets into an accident? Right. You know what I mean? So I'd rather put him on OTR or keep him in lanes like going from Jersey to Virginia or any type of work that's within PA Jersey that pays the most amount of money. And my main thing was that the investors that I was getting in didn't have a lot of money. And also we had a shortage of trailers while we were trying to get these guys in. So I found a whole bunch of power only lanes, which were paying real well. Now, actually my power only guys, and I showed you the numbers before, are actually making more money than... Uh, my OTR guys or the drive van guys are the guys that do have trailers, even reefers. Mm. That's the type of lanes we found. And they're consistent. They're every day. You know what I mean? Because I built the bonds with the brokers. You know what I mean? Because now I can say, hey, my dispatch company has about 30 trucks in this region or 40 trucks in this region. I have an army for you. You don't need to go on the low board. I don't need to go on the low board. Let's make a deal. Mm. That's another part of dispatching. You know what I mean? You have to be able to build bonds with certain brokers that are in your region which will be in the best interest of your guys. Because now if they know what they're doing every day, if they know they're doing a unified run or they're doing this type of run every day, they go pick up a preloaded trailer here and make the stops here and return the trailer and their homes the same day. Everybody's happy. You know what I mean? The investor's happy. The driver's happy. We're happy. And that's all we really need, you know? Got you. All right. So let, let's talk about some of the different niches that, that you work in. So you said you do power only. Yeah. Um, what else do you have your investors doing? So we have some that have trailers. We'll do reefer work. We'll do uh, flatbed work. We'll do dry van work. So those are the most uh, most of the ones that we do. Okay. But other than that, you know, we tried to look into drayage and um, and uh, rail yard work, and uh, and uh, we're looking into a few other endorsement works. Recently, we got a uh, contract lane for double endorsements, which pays well. So I'm having some of my guys go get the double endorsements. But mostly, we work with power only, uh, dry van, or um, Reefer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got you. So you, would you say like the power only is kind of working the best for you right now? Like that's like your sweet spot? Absolutely. Because I put the most attention in there. Because for me, it was like, okay, if I get an investor in here and he just buys a truck versus not buying the trailer because the trailers are expensive and they're being price gouged right now, let me find lanes that are power only so they don't have to get a trailer. And they can get it later on sometimes once the business is cash flow positive and it's bringing in enough money for you not to go out of your pocket, but use the business to buy more assets for the company. Yeah, okay, just for people who may not understand what power only is, just explain that and then, and then talk about how you, how you go about finding some of these power only lanes. 
So power only lanes are tough to come by because a lot of the people that are in them, including me, like I have like maybe a, a lane over here right now with uh, Fitzmark uh, and uh, the broker's name is Evan and Adam, they're really good guys. I have a lane with them where they cover about like 30 to 40 of my guys daily. So, and they don't really post on a low board unless someone drops out and they need an emergency. So the best bet is to, for power only, you have to, the way I did it was, I got a guy in Jersey or PA or New York or wherever, or Atlanta, and I need work for him. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna keep looking every day. I'm gonna be on that board. I'm gonna keep looking until I find the right broker. Now, if you find the right broker, you find a lane where driver is comfortable, investors are happy, or the owners of the company are happy, I'm happy, then you try to build a bond there. You try to ask them every day, hey, do you have a lane today? Do you have this today? Do you have this today? Eventually, you'll start getting in and he'll start using you more because again, it's in their best interest because they don't have to go on the board and you don't have to go on the board. So it's in your best interest as well. Right. And right. those are like automated lanes. You know what I mean? So your company can grow as, as big as possible because let's say you got one person on that lane then two person, three people, how many ever truck you have, you keep putting them on that lane. It's like automation. Got you. Are you still working on the low boards or, or, or is most of your customers like direct, so, direct shippers and brokers that you work on? So now we have about a total of uh, 10 employees that you consulting and we have about five dispatchers. So I have some of them on a division for OTR and they handle that. But the, the thing is, I like to be on the business and I like to be involved and I like to see everything that's going on because for me, client satisfaction is number one. You know what I mean? I want to make sure that the people that are trusting in my brand and investing in me and investing in themselves through me, I want to make sure that they're successful. So I vet out every single load that comes out, but me personally, I'm not really on the load board okay. unless I really need to. Let's say I get a client that's in like Kentucky or somewhere else that needs a lane from that area. At that point, I start targeting, you know, like a sniper. <laughs> Got you. All right. So you said you consulting now has, you said 10 employees? 10, yes. Ten, and, and five are dispatchers? You said? Five are dispatchers. And we have uh, my wife, she does the admin work. Okay. And, uh, my, uh, I, I, even we hired my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law too. So my brother-in-law does like helps out with the billing, gets all the billing done for the carriers, checks the portals, make sure that everybody's billing is okay and nobody has any issues. My sister-in-law and my, and my wife, they, um, they make sure that all the loads are inputted inside and the weekly reports are done. So we have like a very organized system. Got you. How long did it take you to train your dispatchers? Um... I would say maybe two to, uh, on average, like one or two months. And it's still an ongoing process because the way I like to do things and the way I work, I lead by example. So if my guys are covering maybe like five guys, I'm covering 20. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So they see that, they're motivated. They're like, okay. Because even when I first started doing the whole outsourcing thing and I started getting the dispatchers, they didn't believe that I was able to cover all these power only guys. And then I was like, no, yes, I can. And they started seeing the brokerages, the brokers that we're working with. They started seeing the, the rate cons and they started seeing everybody's covered every day. So that gave them more motivation. And then also they bring everything to me. So I, I get the chance to vet it out to make sure that it's good. And now they're like moving on par, just like how I am. Mm. And that's what I want in my team. You know what I mean? One thing I read when I was in jail was that Warren Buffett said that the first thing that he looks at at a company before their revenue is their management team. So for me, I want to make sure that my management team is super strong if I'm going to take it to the next level. Got you. Got you. When it comes to, to actually booking freight and your and, and, and this training, what are you training them to look at on a low board? So I think that's one of the, probably the first things that new dispatchers sh struggle with. What is a good load? What, what, are, what are good areas to start in? How, how do you go about that? How do you approach that for a new dispatcher to figure out where should they be sending people? Um, so a lot of that is communication with the driver. You know what I mean? Now there's some drivers that's just very difficult and that's okay too, but I don't think all of them are like that. I think maybe like a small percentage. So a lot of times you can get an idea from the driver when you speak to him. And that's what I did even when I was an employee working at other companies and being successful there versus having my own company. And now we're doing a hundred thousand a month. But the whole thing is that you have to try to communicate with the driver. You have to talk to him. You have to be like, hey, this is, you know what I mean? This is what's in my hours. This is what I could do. This is what I can't do. If you do that, you'll be all right. But then again, you have to negotiate with the broker. You have to understand, you have to think like a business owner. 
ever since Shark Logistics got started, I, that changed my mindset from a from an employee to a business owner because I started seeing all the overhead expenses. Right. And that's something that I explained to my team. Like, look, they got fuel costs. They got insurance costs. They got this. They got that. They got to pay the driver. So these loads have to make sense. And they have to be in certain regions where they're comfortable in going. In going you know what I mean? So if a load, it, it might be all right. You know what I mean? Don't take it. We want a good load. We want something that everyone's happy in. So that's uh, one of the main focus points uh, that I try to install into my dispatchers. What is what is a good what does a good load look like? <sighs> <laughs> a good load looks like a lot of money, you know what I mean? <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, no, a good load is something that um, that keeps the driver comfortable. So uh, and it's it's it mean it, it's it's a good amount of money in the load. So for instance. Uh, let's say I take a load from New York, from Jersey to New York, and I know the miles are less or whatever, but New York is more congested. There's more high traffic. It takes up more time in there and there's more tolls going up there. Now for me going into New York, I want like 1500 from Jersey or PA. You know what I mean? And right now I get about 1750 for me. That's a good load. Now, if my guys are taking thousand dollar loads or $1,100 loads or $1,200 loads, and that's why I like to be on top of it. Cause I get to vet it out and see, Okay, they'll bring me an option for $1,000 or 800 I'll shoot it down. I'm like, no, bring me something above 1200 And if it gets to a point where they're feeling frustrated that they cannot find it, I'll get on the low board myself and kind of show them and find it for them. So then they realize, oh, okay, it can be done. Mm. Yeah. So, so okay, so let's say you can't find it. I mean, is there ever a time when you have to just kind of take what's there? I mean, you, yeah. can't, you, can't always, you can't always be sweet, right? Absolutely. We have days like that. So we don't want to lose a day. We don't want to, so we, we try to have like, try to pre-plan like the day before. Yeah. So let's say we know tomorrow we got this power only guy here. We try to pre-plan. If we cannot get it, then the next morning we give it about an hour or two. Now the driver's waiting, you know what I mean? In the truck. We can't just have him hold it off like that, you know? So at that point, we'll take whatever we can and fight it the next day. Got you. For, for, for your investors, what, what does a good week look like for them? <laughs> 10,000 on average all my investors do about 10,000 a week okay okay yeah. got you and what does that week typically look like for them like what are their drivers doing to make that 10,000 so we have these local lanes that uh, again I started off and put like one or two trucks in there and then I started just transferring the rest of my trucks as they started telling me I would be in, in direct con contact with the brokers so what I like to do right I like to get the broker's cell phone Okay. That's one thing that I try to do. Like, let's say we do two or three loads together. I try to get the broker's cell phone. And the reason being is that I can text them more often, like every morning. Hey, good morning. How you doing? Do you have a load for today or tomorrow? And then eventually like that, we start getting into these lanes that other people are in and where they need high demand. So right now we're in, um, in a bunch of different lanes where they can cover all my guys. You know what I mean? So for instance, you go to pick up a preloader in PA, you make two to three stops in uh, New York, and you return the preloaded trailer back. It's about 240 mile round trip. And you're getting paid 1750 for the day. You know, after tolls, fuel, paying the driver, the, paying the dispatch company, the investors are maybe profiting about 900 to a thousand dollars. Got you, got you. What, what, what's something like, like that, like that tip you just now gave, right? You know, getting the broker's, num getting the broker's personal phone number. It might sound simple, yeah. But it's something that you do that kind of gives you an edge, right? What are some other things that you do as a dispatcher and as a dispatch company that other companies aren't doing that gives you an edge on your competition? I have a lot of urgency. A lot of urgency. So that that's very important to have. Like, you have to actually care. You have to actually... So for me, any load that we do, anything that happens throughout the week, at the end of the day, I, I write down at least 10 things that went wrong. And then the next day I try to improve on that. So it's all about just finding strategies on how to improve your game. It's, it's really, cause even at the scale that we're at right now, even at what I'm doing, I'm on one side juggling with investors, taking care of them, other side taking care of, of operations, and then also focusing on expansion. So that's three different roles that I gotta take on at once by myself. And um, the one thing, and, and how I'm able to do that is because of the pressure that I'm able to take on. So let's say Sam back in 2020 was able to take on a certain amount of pressure. Now I'm able to take on more pressure than back then. So I have like this rule where 
whatever was 100% pressure last year for me, last January, should only be 10% this year. Mm. And I feel as though that's how you evolve as a businessman because it's all about how you take pressure. You know what I mean? Because people, they quit a, a under pressure. You know, that's the main thing I think that you have to be able to take on pressure. It is really nothing different that I'm doing that a lot of people can't do. I'm, I don't come from like, I didn't even graduate high school. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not that tough. You have to be consistent. You have to have urgency and you have to go out and try to make bonds with these brokers in order to get what you need. Got you. You, you said that you write down things that go wrong, right? You take that kind of feedback and you try to improve on them. What are some of the things that go wrong in your business on a regular basis? So, miscommunication a lot of times because this business isn't perfect. So one of the things that I do is I have these WhatsApp groups where I have the owner, the driver, uh, the dispatcher billing. So we get to see everything that's going on. You know what I mean? So sometimes maybe someone might call the driver and tell him one thing and then the broker's told something else and we botched the load. So we want to, so the one thing I want to do is also focus on bro broker satisfaction. So we make sure that we get the loads done properly. And a lot of times I've noticed that we miss that. So that's one of my main things that's on that list almost every night. And it might, because we're running a big operation now. So it's like, there might be one or two that happen every day, but we try to minimize it as much as possible. Or I might get angry one day. I might be a little like aggressive with my team. You know what I'm saying? Because I want to meet this goal and I'm so urgent to get this done. But then I realize at night that like, no, I need to make sure that my team is motivated and happy where they're working, not upset or scared to bring me any problems because they'll think that I'll get upset. Right. And that's one of my uh, things that I have to fix as well that to, to be able to control my anger. Cause you know what I mean? Cause sometimes there's, a lot of stuff going on. You got an investor complaining to you. You got a broker complaining to you. You got the driver complaining to you. You know, so you got a lot of issues that you have to try to put out, you know, and put out a lot of fires. So that could really overwhelm you as a person. Right, right. But it's, you know, sometimes I might say something to my team like, hey, no, you guys did this wrong. You need to do this better. But that's something that, you know, just control my anger. So there's a few different things that I really write down and try to just figure out like, okay, how do I do this better the next day? Yeah. And I think that's a part of being a successful person or, or if you want to be a successful person, you need to have that key characteristic is being self-reflective. Mm. You know what I mean? You have to be self-reflective. You have to look at all the things that you did wrong and admit that you're doing them wrong and try to correct them. Right. If not, you're never going to change the problem. And gotcha. even as an entrepreneur, that's your main thing. You have to find solutions. And if you're not finding solutions because you can't even identify the problem when it's you yourself, then you're not going to, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. How, how do you manage all these different relationships? You have these investors. Do they ever feel like you're taking care of one investor more than the other investor? Or this, the, you're, playing, you're playing favorites? How, how do you manage everybody's personalities and, and keep them at bay to, to let them know that you're doing the best job you can for each of them, each of their companies? Well, for me... Every investor means the same to me. They're all, they all, and I, and I, and this is something that I, I, I also learned about reading a book from Warren Buffett. You know what I mean? Like, like, or it was a quote by him. A lot of times we get biased in business. We'll get emotional in business. So let's say you're an investor that I don't like, or I might not dislike something about you. Right. But that doesn't mean I'm going to let it get to the business. So for me, uh, every investor is the same. I want to see all of them successful. I want to see all of them booming. Whatever reservation, personal opinions I have doesn't matter at that point. But if an investor feels as though that I'm treating one better than the other, that might be just something personally on them. You know, their own insecurity. That's something out of my control. You know what I mean? I can't, <laughs> right. I can't change that, you know? Right, right, right. So I, and, I, and I learned that as a person, as, a, as an entrepreneur, that there's certain things that I can't, can change, can control, and there's certain things I can't. Right. So be, being able to take on all that pressure and evolving as a businessman, the one thing I learned is that I'm not going to be able to control everything, including in my business. I try to control what I can. And I'm not going to worry about the rest. Got you. H how many companies are you working with now altogether? So right now, I think we have about maybe 30, 30 carriers. 30 carriers, yeah. right? Okay. So with those, with those 30, um, you, you, uh, you, okay, you, you're the you're dispatching all of them, right? Yeah, every single company. Mm -hmm. All right, um, that's a lot. H how do you like? When is it too much? Or is it ever too much? It's never too much. I I'm trying to make it to another level. You know what I mean? So for me, it's just 
Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. Okay. Okay. And but but as you add on companies, you want to add on people as well, yeah. right? Yeah. We we have three dispatchers right now, pending and training. So, you know, like I said, our margins, so we're making a hundred thousand a month, and I'm gonna be fully transparent. Our profit margin is maybe 70%. So we're we're making about seventy thousand dollars. We have a little bit of a cushion room, a lot of cushion room actually, to be able to start hiring more people and bringing them on and training them. So we could continue to grow and continue to keep adding people, keep expansion. Because if we start going slow now, then I think that'll be the death of my company because we need to evolve with the times. We need to keep moving. We need to keep expanding because maybe um, I started maybe 75 companies in the last year mm. and I have 30 carriers. So right. a lot of them have left, you know, a lot of them have went on to do their own thing. They wanted in-house stuff and that's cool. You know, I don't have no contracts with none of them. I give everybody the option and the free will be like, hey, you want to leave tomorrow? You're not happy with me? Go ahead. Right. I don't try to put chains or binders. Even my admin team has spoken to me a few times. Let, let's start doing contracts. And if they don't do contracts, we'll find them. I said, no, that's been my policy since day one. I'm not doing that. Gotcha. So I give people, you know, the option. If you're not happy with me, go try it out somewhere else. And I've had a few people do that and then come right back. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Now, when when we first got together before we got on the, on the pod and started recording, you were showing me like your phone and showing me like you know how you kind of operate your business and you basically run your whole business on your phone. Yeah, right. Talk talk about some like the tools and the software that you use to just run this company with all these carriers. How how do you manage it? So the 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 good thing about uh, the way I think, I'm like the most laziest proactive person <laughs> that, that 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 you'll meet. Right. So for me, it's like, you know, I'm on the go because I remember when I first started this, I'm like, you know, I can't be in front of my computer all the time. And a lot of these TMS systems, they're that like you got to be on your computer or even with the making calls and going in front of the computer. But the phone, it got so much stuff now. You could just download something like a Raycon or a BOL. We, we do. We, you could do your own billing right through your phone. So we started creating like these WhatsApp groups. And in order to not have any miscommunication, we started putting the owner in there, the driver. We'll have like an admin group where we'll send the Raycons. And then we'll have like a separate group where, where we'll send the driver the addresses. So now if something goes wrong, I can hold my team uh, accountable and the investor can hold his driver accountable. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But, but that was one of the biggest issues that I've seen, even me working as a dispatcher at other companies, was there would be a lot of miscommunication. Mm. A lot of people would like, you know, blame the driver, blame the dispatcher. And that'll take up so much time. Right. And that's losing money. Driver will end up quitting or the dispatcher will end up quitting. But now, no, we, we have everything right here. We have chats. We can go back months and see what happened here, see what happened there. And it just holds everybody accountable. Yeah. So you literally like do everything like in a what and like using a WhatsApp group. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have we have groups. We have like, okay, this company, Noah Logistics admin, then Noah, Noah Logistics truck 001, Noah Logistics truck 002. We put a picture of the truck. You know what I mean? We mm. we we try to uh we try to make it look nice and the driver send us the POD through there. My billing guy sees the POD, goes to the admin group, attaches it together and uses the genius scanner. It's a free app. It will screenshot everything, put it together, email it to him as a PDF, upload it to the portal and bill it in. Got you. What what about compliance for your companies cuz I mean, you talked about earlier you had a a huge accident, right? Yeah. In, in early in your career. What do you do for compliance with all these uh, carriers? Are they in charge of their own compliance? How do you guys do that? So compliance, as far as like what we can control, as far as operations, mm -hmm. we try to make sure that they don't get no freight guards, that the drivers out with the driver's loads are within their hours. You know what I mean? So we try to calculate all that to make sure that we're not doing anything wrong. I, I don't want my driver, no matter how much money it is, I'm not going to take a load, which will put my driver in jeopardy as far as his hours or get him in trouble. So we try to do our due diligence where we can to make sure that we don't put the company or the investor or the driver at any risk. But then the other part, like doing the if does, we can refer you to the right people. Or if you have a safety issue, there's smart safety services. That's who helped us with our uh, situation to happen. So if there's a big deal, I do have the right resources, the right contact. But we more more so just handle operations. Operations. So you guys aren't really like reviewing like logs and log edits and uh, like like medical cards and you know stuff like that. Like the company will make sure that happens. Or you have other people that do that service for you. We got to get the investors to do some work. <laughs> 
Right, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be clear, man. I don't like know I how said. much you guys are doing. You know, you might no. be taking care of everything. No, no, we, we we try to take care of what we can. And then if an investor comes to me and be like, hey, Sam, I'm not understanding this. And I am well versed in IFTA and stuff like that. I'll refer them over to like my brother who does IFTA. You okay. know what I mean? Or I'll refer them over to my friend who uh, does compliance and stuff like that. Because we have other companies. But the whole thing about this business for dispatching and, and operations, how we handle things, we want to be able to be scale, scalable. You know what I mean? So... We take on and focus on operations. We want that to be our niche. Operations, the billing part, making sure these drivers are making the most amount of money per week. That's what I want us to just mainly focus on. Got you. What's your biggest uh, success story, if you could think of, of one, for a client or an investor that you've worked with? There's a few. So there, there's one company, F1 Couriers. You know what I mean? They started off uh, in November with like maybe two trucks. It's three partners. It's uh, Shafiq. Uh, his name is Muhammad Gregory, Isan Noble, Razak. They're like brothers to me and I love them a lot. And they uh, were able to scale their company from like one truck to like, now I think they have about 30 or 40, something like that. 30, and that was, a, it was like in a year. What, what are they doing? What's their niche? So, I mean, I don't know if I... You, know, <laughs> you ain't got to yeah. tell me everything, but, but you know, yeah, they, they, just to get an idea of what they, how they were able to scale that much because they must have... Uh, some they must be doing something that is there's a high demand obviously to scale like that that fast well they, they, they're well respected or they, or they diversified like what are they doing they're well respected in the community and also they have the right contacts you know what i mean they, they've been around for a while they've also been in other industries so they're trying to bring their other people together and bring them in here under the f1 courier umbrella and trying to grow it out like that Mm, got you. Do they have trailers too? Trailers, everything. Yeah, they got okay. they got the UAII certifications. They they're doing good. They're doing good. Got you. Another one of my guys, he's actually a police officer from Patterson. Uh, his name is Jensen Burgos. I helped him start off one stop trucking, and um, I think he has about like this was early last year, and he was uh, doing cargo vans, and he wasn't making that much money in cargo vans, so I got him into this. And he started off with like one truck, and I think now he has like six. Okay. And his, and his numbers are consistently high. Like each truck, we do about nine to ten thousand a week at least. Got you. And you, so you're still you're still doing the dispatching for F1, and you're doing it for this gentleman one stop. Yeah, you, yeah, everybody. You're working with all of them. Yeah. So to, all together, you're doing like about what you say, like 80, 80 trucks. Actually, yeah. actually, units now. Yeah, units about eighty. I think about between seventy to eighty on and off. Got you. So, so what? What's your role? Because you said you you've actually like uh, allocated a lot of the dispatching mm -hmm. to to. So, what what do you kind of do on a day to day basis? How are you? Are you recruiting more people? What What are you doing actively on a regular basis? So, I'm learning to kind of trust my my team more, and I'm learning to let them handle more of the stuff and get used to it while I oversee them, so I can focus on expansion. Like this year, we want to add ten of our own trucks. Okay, and we don't want. No one investing. We don't want to finance nothing that we want to buy that from the capital that we raise from you consulting. So that's the next step to take us from making a hundred thousand a month to a million dollars a month. We want to start our brokerage. We want to start our technology company. We also have our courses coming out. They were supposed to be out last year of November, but there's a delay because me and uh, my my team that we've been working on, on it with. I feel as though that the the courses that are out there right now, and we've seen a few of them, we want to bring something better. You know what I mean? I, if it has my name and my brand, I don't want it to be nothing copy pasted. I wanted it. To, I want it to be a real experience where people could actually learn. Mm. So those are coming out March nineteenth. So we have a few big things that we're also doing here. You consulting to expand the brand out further. Got you. Got you. You said you want to do something better with the courses and add like add more value? What are some of the things that you think that you will do differently than what you've seen out there? So a lot of the information, it's cold cut. You know what I mean? A lot of this stuff to a beginner is tough to understand, especially so. I, especially if you don't have like set examples or videos and stuff. My, one of the things that I'm also doing different is I'm going to put examples of videos, like certain things that could go wrong and how to re resolute them. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. So for instance, let's say um let's say a driver uh let's say a driver uh has an issue with his uh with the, with the truck, right? And you're on the load. You can't cancel on the broker, but how would you how would you go about 
uh, talking to the broker. You know what I mean? Like, mm. what would you do? You know what I mean? Because if you cancel on the broker and it's last minute, they'll give you a freight guard. And a normal dispatcher, you might just email something back, but they might not want to hear that. You might, you have to get the receipts. You know what I mean? Or even if something doesn't happen and something's going on with the truck or the driver has an emergency or something, those type of situations are stuff that these dispatch courses don't train them for. You know what I mean? Mm. For them to get out of that. Yeah, troubleshooting. You know what I mean? So for them to get out of a certain situation that's uh, not on these courses, you know? So what would you do in that situation? I'd be fully transparent with the broker. <laughs> I'd be fully transparent. I would get the receipts. I would send them over to the brokers. You know what I'm saying? And then also, like, for instance, you know, if if if, if you want to try to find a lane for, for, these, for your drivers or, like, your dispatching or whatever, you got to understand their time. You know what I mean? That's one of the things that, that people are not doing in these courses as well. They're not explaining to them how to, like, really – get these guys and find out their times and stuff like that. And it's just like all verbiage. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot more to this business than just verbiage. You know, you have to understand and actually see and feel what, what these drivers have to go through every day. You know what I mean? Where, where they're going, what are high traffic area, what are low traffic areas, what heavy weight versus low weight means, you know what I mean? For the fuel and for the truck and the trailer. So there's a lot of moving parts. And I don't even think that even my dispatch course or any dispatch course out there can fully cover it. Cause it's just like I was telling you earlier, you know, you could take residencies all day trying to be a doctor, but you won't actually learn anything until you actually operate. Right. So I also want to incorporate people and give them some of my strategies on how I got trucks and how I was able to dispatch them and stuff. So not only are they investing into my course, but they're also going to be investing into themselves because they'll learn the strategies that I use to help get new people into this business. Maybe that's what they want to try to do or get an investor. Like I told you earlier, if I was in a certain situation as a dispatcher, or as a driver, what I would do. You know what I mean? Right. So I want them to understand these strategies and actually try to make money off of this and not just buy someone's course and not get nothing out of it. Right, right, right. Um, for for the drivers now, I mean, obviously everybody's talking about the driver shortage. How are, how are you guys and your investors doing with recruiting drivers? And what are some of the strategies that you guys are using to recruit drivers? So, so the driver shortage and... Um, Lack of drivers, that we've always had that issue in this industry. We've always had a problem getting proper drivers. But also, a part of the, the, when I was telling you earlier that I want the drivers to be comfortable in the routing, when we try to talk to these drivers, when we try to interview them, we give them options. You know what I mean? We give them options. We also pay them top dollars. Because these aren't like trucking businesses that have been around for years. These are new businesses. These are startups. And they are willing to pay more to get the right driver. And they're willing to be more understanding with the driver. So it's a team effort. Driver's happy. Owner's happy. We're happy. And, and I push for the drivers to get a better cut also because they deserve it. You know what I mean? Mm. They're the ones out there actually risking themselves versus um, me or the owner or anybody else. You know? Right. What, what, do you, what do you find is the best way to compensate drivers for their work? Uh, I would say either percentage or put them on a salary daily. You know what I mean? Either percentage of what they do, that'll motivate them because they'll be commission-based. If not, if they're doing like a set route and it's dedicated or something, then I would say salary. But it would all depend on the work. Do they have to assist? Do they have to put their hands on something? Is it no touch? Is it like a certain amount of miles? How, you know? Yeah. So it's a few different factors, but the two that I prefer is either salary or percentage. It keeps things a lot easier and more simpler. I know people like getting paid by the miles, but my whole strategy with dispatching also, it's not about more miles. It's about more money, less miles. I try to do one day transits. I don't try to do two, three day transits, four or five days, none of that. Because mm. with one day transits, you can make more money on the mile than you can with two day transits. If I was to send a guy from Georgia to Jersey, I'd probably get like 1,500, 1,600, 1,700. But let's say I send him from Georgia to North Carolina or Georgia to Tennessee. I'm making a thousand, twelve hundred, maybe thirteen hundred, and then from Tennessee to Jersey, you'll get a banging rate. Probably make like two thousand. So you're making, and then let's say from North Carolina to Jersey, probably make like fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred, maybe eighteen hundred. Mm. So if just by breaking it out down in the middle, and now you could even take it a step further, break it down from North Carolina to Maryland, or North Carolina to Ohio, or or PA, you know what I mean? Somewhere in the middle again, and then bring it back to Jersey. So for about the same amount of miles that you were gonna do 
fifteen, sixteen hundred for, you can end up making three thousand for. And that's the margin which the owners save. What's the difference between those lanes? Why why are you getting better rates? Because the brokers will pay you better if you're doing uh, lesser miles versus if you're doing more miles. So let's say you're taking a load from Georgia to Jersey. They're, they're paying you for one pick, one drop, and they'll prorate it out because you're going straight from one place to the next. And that's just how the market always works. But now if you break it in the middle and do one-day transits, you probably make like maybe two times the money. Mm. Yeah. Is there any particular uh, regions you like to run or areas you like to run your guys? I like the Northeast, like New Jersey, tri-state area, New York, PA, Connecticut. There's just a lot of work out here. What what type of work are you do you, are you finding, and and why do you like the Northeast? Because there, uh, so a lot of people are scared to go to New York, so a lot of drivers are also scared to go to New York. But we got lanes which pay real well, and they go to New York, and the drivers will will end up doing them because those lanes you're home right away, meaning the same day versus being out all day, you know what I mean? Or being out for days and stuff. Right. And it's local, you know what I mean? Let's say you pick up in PA, make some stops in New York, go return the trailer back to PA, and you're home, you know what I mean? Walmart got DCs out here. Family Dollar has DCs out here. Petco, Unify. There's so many lanes out here, you know what I mean, compared to anywhere else, you know what I mean? A lot, even if you go down to Georgia, there's way more competition than there is actual lanes. Are a lot of these uh, lanes touch freight? Yes. You have to unload. Yeah. So that's something that you have to, you know, obviously discuss with the driver and make mm -hmm. sure that they are physically able to do it. And, and that's also a liability too, you know, guys yeah. get injured and stuff like that. So you have yeah. to consider that. Absolutely. I mean, they don't really like touch free as far as like uh, unloading the whole trailer themselves. A lot of these are like tailgating. They give you like a power power jack yep. or a power jack and you just tailgate the product. And we do compensate them more for that because we're getting compensated more for that. So we try to be fair with them. But also, those are the lanes that a lot of people don't want to do. So, so my guys would do them. Through. Yeah. And I'll train them to do them. I'll tell them, hey, look, do this, do that. I'll send them with the experienced driver to see how it works. And a lot of times, it's not even as tough as most people think it is. You know, I think, honestly, one of the issues is that a lot of the older people that was in this business, they're still in that whole mindset of underpaying the drivers and saving more for the company. It's not the case anymore. You need to take care of your drivers. Mm. You know what I mean? Put put the driver first. Put the driver first. Make sure they make their money and they'll take care of you and, and grow yeah. your business. Without them, you're nothing. <laughs> yeah, nah, hundred percent. What? Give give me some other uh, little dispatch tips and tricks, man. While while we're while we're talking about it, um, so that that's one right there. You know, maybe doing those touch freight loads that a lot of people are staying away from because mm -hmm. you can get that low hanging fruit. What's what's some other things that that you think about? Try to keep the deadhead low. Try to keep it under 100 miles because that consumes time and fuel. So you want to try to make sure that the deadhead is low and try to keep the weight low because what happens is when the weight is over 40,000, 42,000, it'll start giving issues to the truck. You know what I mean? Because that's a real heavy weight. And when you have lighter weight, it's less pressure. And then also you save money on fuel too versus if you're doing a um, heavier load. And then with the deadhead thing, people forget it's not just fuel going out 150 miles somewhere. It also takes up a lot of time. And then traffic and stuff like that. I might take a load that pays less closer to me versus a load that pays more further away because of the time. Mm. Now the driver mess around, drive four hours, then does 10 hours on the load. He already illegal, out of time. Versus if he does a load that's an hour away and then puts in the 10 hours, now he's legal. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you got to watch out for stuff like that, you know? And then also, you want to negotiate with the broker. I'll give you guys a tip that, that I use early on. So I used to be a little scared to negotiate or ask the price that I wanted from the brokers. So what I used to do was I'll call them up. And I'm the only person there. No one else is there. I'll call up the broker, and I'll just put him on hold after he gives me a rate. I'll be like, hey, let me check on my supervisor. Meanwhile, there's no supervisor. I'm just sitting in front of my computer. I put him on hold, and a minute later, I go back, hey, my supervisor would really like to be at 1700 or 1800 what that does is it takes the responsibility off of you and puts it on your supervisor or your imaginary supervisor and you're able to still present you know if you if you don't have the confidence yet right. to actually talk to the brokers especially for beginners that's a good tip you know so that way and then he might be like all right can you see with your supervisor if you could do 16 or meet me somewhere in the middle 
and you get more money. You know what I mean? If they happy with the rate, and you're not winning. You know what I mean? <laughs> they accept it too fast. If they accept it too problem. fast, yeah. it's a problem. You know what I mean? So you want to always try to push the envelope. Yeah. Do it for your team, you know? How, how do you know where you, where you want to be at? When you're looking at a particular lane, are you using the software that the load board provides you? How, how do you know what's what's a good uh, a good rate and what's not? Well, Aside from just experience. Yeah, the experience is the main thing. You know, experience is the main thing because I, I know right away, like, okay, this isn't my best interest. But then you, it's 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 easy. It's it's simple. Like if you know a load is going three hundred miles, paying fifteen hundred dollars or sixteen hundred dollars, for me personally, I'm never satisfied. I always try to push the envelope and be like, "Can you do eighteen? You know what I mean? It's the customer's money. Uh, you know what I mean, I'm gonna keep trying. But you know, what I mean, no offense to any brokers that are watching out there. But anyways, um, you know, I'm gonna try to push the envelope. If they're uncomfortable with it and they meet me down somewhere, then it's cool. Well, but I'm still gonna try. Right. But uh, let's say it's 300 miles. You know what I mean? Fuel on average, maybe what, like $150, $175. And driver pay for the day, maybe 200, 250, 300. I don't know. But just average it out to maybe $300. So you lose 175 plus 300. That's 475. The low pays four, the, the low pays 1500. Take out $100 for insurance. You left with 575. And Take out the dispatch fee, six seventy five maybe. You know what I mean? That's what you got to minus out, and you're left with the, the owner with a cushion of maybe, I would say seven to eight hundred dollars out of that load. Right. That's that's not bad. You know what I mean? If he puts away like a hundred dollars for maintenance and he's profiting five hundred dollars off of that load, I think it's a good load. Got you. And and if I tried and they didn't give me the price that I wanted and they still gave me a decent price where the owner is saving like five hundred to a thousand dollars, I'm happy with it. Yeah, yeah. Give me, give me another negotiating tip. I, I love negotiations and and people. I think that's another place where people struggle a lot. The phone. You have to take any leverage that you have, and use it. Let's say the load's heavy. Listen, man, this load's heavy. This could make my driver tire blow out or something. You know what I mean? And then I'm stuck with a bill from roadside for seven hundred dollars. You know, so this I really need more money for this. Because I this is a heavier load, or if it's in a region where most people would not want to go, so anything that you can use for leverage, you you try to use it within that lane that they give you. Mm. You know what I mean? So you so bring, you're, you're picking that load apart, trying to find what what is, what, what can I say to this this mm -hmm. broker that's gonna that gives me leverage, gives me the absolutely. Upper hand. Okay, the appointment time is at nine at night. Listen, nine at night, I'm not gonna be able to find a load. Everybody's gonna be gone. You know what I'm saying? He's gonna be delivering late. I need at least, uh, you know, an extra 500 because I'm going to lose out for the day or at least another 1,000. A lot of people don't do that. You got to check the timings, make sure it's a morning drop off. If it's an afternoon dropout, even then you, you try to, oh, it's going to be real tough to find a load at that time. It might not, it might be, but you use that. Right, right. You know what I mean? Anything you can find for leverage, you use it during your negotiations. And at, at certain times, it's like boom, 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 you know? So you got to... Think it up on the spot, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's what I do, and it, and it works. Do you believe in scripts? Like, when you train people, do you train people to, like, say a certain thing to kind of start the conversation off, or do you feel like just being more relaxed and more real is is better? I feel as though just being myself. I try, like, being, like, uh, changing myself up or this, that, third, but I'm not comfortable when I'm doing that. So for me, it's just more about being authentic and being who I am and presenting myself in that in that manner and not trying to be something else. Right. Because when you try to be something else, you know, it's going to be tougher to keep that facade going. Because mm. you might get caught and then you might, you know, might offend somebody or might offend the broker. Like, you know, you're trying to play a game on me. You know what yeah. I mean? Versus if you're just being yourself and you're just like, yeah, this is the expenses that my guys have. Like, this is, this load doesn't make sense. Can you do it for 1800 or 1900 or 2000 Whatever the price range. I mean, I wouldn't say try to rip them off or try to be, unreasonable, but there's always room to negotiate. Right. What, what advice do you have for new dispatchers trying to get their first carrier? Because that's the hardest part, right? Trying to get your first company to, to trust in you. What do you tell them? Like, you know, some people will say, hey, yeah, tell them you got a bunch of freight. Or some people will say, you know, tell them you got a bunch of people you work with. Or what, what would you tell them to say? How, how, how do you land that first carrier? Well, the, the whole thing with the first carrier is this. 
I would tell any dispatcher that's starting out, even if you take a course or anything, you need to go out and get experience first. I would say go work for a trucking company for three months, six months. There's a lot. There's plenty of them that's willing to train you and pay you less to kind of, like when I started this, I was giving out information for free. I was starting people's companies for free, giving them, making them thousands and thousands of dollars until I got to a point where I wanted to be. So I would say really let your work speak for yourself. And if you're really a beginner, you're not going to be able to satisfy a true client like to the point where they're going to actually be happy with your work compared to the competition because there is a lot of competition. Right. You know what I mean? So I would recommend really starting off trying to get experience somewhere. And then from there, you start building bonds with either owner operators or people that's like, you know, that's in the business. You know what I mean? And try to get your first carrier. And from there, second, third, fourth, and keep building that way. But my strategy, like I told you, bringing in investors that have no knowledge of this business it has been great for me. Because that gives me an access to an unlimited amount of people. Because now every person that's worked with me has been successful. As long as they've been with me, I don't know what's happened after, if they went somewhere else. As long as they've been with me, they've been successful. Every single one of them. And the thing about it is that that right there shows that my strategy works. Right. You know what I mean? Because I'm bringing these people in. I'm making them successful. So I got a line out the door. Right now. Even right now. You know what I mean? I think I have five people pending this month that I still got to take on. Another five next month. Mm. You know what I mean? So my strategy isn't going to go. So that you need to figure something like that for your business where you know that you can help them establish or get them established. If not, they're already established. Give them a better service than what they're getting right now. Got you. What? Th that's very tough for beginners to do. That's, that's why I would say get some experience first. A hundred percent. What what does what does success look like for you? How, what what makes you feel as though you're you're being successful in what you do? I'm motivated, and my my purpose, like I, I don't I don't look at it like any end end goal. Like even with this company, I didn't think in a year I'd be making a hundred thousand a month. You know what I'm saying? I didn't think that. For me, it was just like putting in the work because this makes me happy. This is my purpose. This keeps me away from all the bullshit that I've been through. So for me, it's been that just keeps me on the right track. And then wherever it goes, it goes. You know what I mean? Because it's not the destination that's 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 the that's the beauty. It's, it's the journey. Mm. You know what I mean? So I, I, I enjoy this journey. I love seeing new entrepreneurs come into this business. I love seeing their take. I love see them grow. You know what I mean? It's a beautiful thing. Nah, I, I agree. And I mean, your, your people definitely speak highly of you. You know, you got a lot of love out there and a lot of people who will vouch for your services and vouch for what you've been doing for them. So obviously your work speaks for itself, you know? And I know that has to feel good. No, you know what feels better? Getting that from the godfather of trucking. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. I mean, I, I see it. You know no, what I mean? I, I, that, I see the love. So, I mean, you're not going to get that kind of love unless people are happy with, 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 with the work you're doing. You know what I mean? Absolutely. But a part of that is that I care. You know what I mean? Uh, for me, it's always been that, look, if someone putting in like 10, 20, 30,000 of their hard-earned money that they save and they're doing it off of my brand, U Consulting stands for Umer Chaudhry. That's my first two initials. So if I put my name on my brand and people can trust it, that means more to me than money. You know what I'm saying? So my whole thing is that I actually care a lot. You know what I mean? I don't like seeing the investors fail. I don't like, like, for instance, last week this happened. We had two drivers quit on us right away. And I don't look for drivers. I usually, like, do the interviews for them or I help them make the ads and stuff. I started putting up ads on my Instagram. I started putting up ads everywhere. And contacting all my drivers and saying, hey, I'll give you $500 referral fee. And I got a driver the next day and he's working now. Right. And he's very happy. And we're making more money with him. Right, right, We right. just had one driver that was just not cooperative at all. We switched him on to OTR, we switched him on to local lanes. They didn't like anything. So he was causing a problem. And then the, the carrier was concerned. For me, it was like, you know what? No, I'm going to go out there and get you a driver. Right. And right. I did. And, yeah. and I mean, that, uh, you said a very important word. You said we, like you feel as though that company is your company. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So if they lose a driver, you lose a driver. So Absolutely. You're going to be proactive and you're going to make sure that you solve that problem right away. Absolutely. 
Uh, I, I love that, man. All right, man. Well, I, I think we've been, you know, banging it out. You know, it's, it's, it's been a great podcast. I think um, you dropped a lot of jewels. You gave a lot of info. I was just, you know, trying to pull some things out of there, you know, before you got in and, and, and you dropped the course. You know, I like to get the freebies out there. Um, is there anything else that I didn't cover that you want to make sure that 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 the audience knows about before we before we wrap? Uh, yeah. Okay. The one thing that I do want to say is that in this business or any business, especially a high risk business, if you want to be successful long term, you got to know how to take on pressure. That's the one thing that's going to differentiate you. It's like you got to think of it like you're an athlete and you're performing at the highest levels. So at that point, what differentiates you versus your competition or anyone else that's trying to be in your place is how much pressure you can take. Because if you're not able to take on pressure and you crack, that's it. You know what I mean? Like sometimes <laughs> it has happened to me in the beginning when I started this company where I seen like a pitfall, you know what I mean? I seen, oh, damn. In my mind, I'm thinking like, you know what I mean? Damn, I'm, I'm effed up, you know what I mean? Yeah. But on my face, my acting skills come out and I'm like, you know, nah, man, like, yeah, we got this. Ain't nothing. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Don't so, let them see you sweat. Don't let them see you sweat. You know yeah. what I mean? Don't, 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 don't. And nobody going to care. You know what I mean? You got to make sure that you're doing what's right for your business and be selfish with your goals. You know what I mean? Don't, don't F over anybody else, but at the same time, be selfish and keep growing. Keep growing. If I can do it, a kid that's been in prison since he was 15 and all these obstacles, all these stacks, uh, odds stacked against him, anybody else can too, man. Nah, 100%. So my final question would be, if an investor wants to work with you, aside from just them being driven and you know being coachable, what do, what do they, in this climate today, what do you need to have financially, what do you need to have in terms of credit? What what do you see a, 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 a viable investor looks like to you today to come and work with you? Well, minimum, just for to get not not even talking about my fees or anything, but just minimum, all the things that you need and the amount of ca amount of capital you need to get your company off the ground, minimum is like 30 to 40k right now. Okay. I mean, for the truck, insurance, registration, um, you know, escrow. Like about thirty to forty k minimum, and 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 what how how has has COVID and the truck shortage and anything impacted that start? Because you've been doing this for quite a while. So what are the changes you've seen from an investor getting in today from someone who may have got in a year ago? The truck prices went up. The truck prices went up a lot, but not to say you can't still get financing and still get a good down payment. But it hasn't been that big of a change. It's just that the truck prices have went up. Gotcha. And other than that, it's still the same old thing. You know what I mean? You need a lot of drive. It's a high risk business. Realize what you're getting into. And once you're ready for that, that's it. You know, it's time to go. It's time game, to go. Game time. It's time, and I do something and I, I'm going to let it, I'm going <laughs> to let it out now. I kind of shock the investors, you know what I mean? And I, and I don't mean like in a bad way, but I, I, I try to just kind of like make it easy. Like just be like, Hey, look, is you know, like try to like, Word it to, to the point where they're like, um, once they get into the business, it's a shock. You know what I mean? Because this is a high, high risk business. You're on the road, this, that, the third. You got this issue, that issue. But I'll tell you one thing, though. All the investors that I've been with, they've all been successful. Like they all, you know what I mean? They've learned, they've grown, you know what I mean? And they've learned a lot of these things because there are a lot of pitfalls, especially because this is a machine. Anything can happen to it, you know? Right. Right. So, but that's the one thing, you know, you got to, you got to try to just be driven and be able to identify problems and solve it right away and get your truck back on the road. No doubt. No doubt. All right. So you've been here before. So, you know, we got to give a final thought. I need another final thought from you and then let everybody know where they can connect with you and learn more about you consulting. My final thought, um, I'm just blessed to be, uh, doing what I'm doing and, uh, this is a very, very beautiful business. There's a lot of money to be made in this business. If you do it the right way, you don't have to have a super strong background financially either. You could be a dispatcher. You could drive. Even if, let's say, you're a driver, you get your class A CDL, you gather an investor together, you partner up with them. You know what I mean? And you don't have the capital. You start your first truck, second truck. You could grow out as big as you want as long as you're driven. And the way to contact me, so we do have a website, but we started getting too many um, clicks for the to, for the consultations and the call. And this is something that my wife had designed and everything. 
I had to have her cancel that out. <laughs> so you can't really get in touch with me like that uh, off of the website anymore. But you could go to Instagram, underscore you consulting, you know, give a shout out to one of my uh, posts or follow me. You know what I mean? Show some love and you DM me, I'll, I'll probably respond back right away. No doubt, no doubt. I right, hustle fam. If you don't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. You know what we do around this time. If you smell something burning, it's only a desire. And me and Sam, we out. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.